In this final video on externalities, I want to say a few brief things about command and control. Now, the, the definition of command and control is uh, a solution to an externality, or at least a way of addressing an externality, that regulates behavior. Instead of, like with a Pigouvian tax or subsidy, uh, you know, trying to make the price efficient in the market and therefore guide the market to the right, uh, the right solution, the right level of output, and instead of just leaving things to people's bargaining decisions, like with the Coase theorem, command and control is where the government comes in and says, you must do this or you must not do the other thing. Uh, the example that they used in the textbook was, um, uh, let's see, 2007, I think, the government made it so that it was illegal to buy and sell um, wash machines and dryers that were not energy efficient. So that law went into effect. The idea there was reduce the amount of electricity consumption in the United States by a certain amount. And the solution that the regulator imposed was, well, let's, let's make it so that these particular um, appliances have to be energy efficient. They have to reduce their energy use by a certain amount. Same thing happens uh, with uh, fuel efficiency standards for automobiles in the United States. Um, the government imposes a regulation. I think they started in the 1960s or 70s imposing regulations that said all cars must of a certain uh, within a certain category must get so many uh, miles to the gallon. OK, by the way, that is one of the reasons why in the U.S. today cars look so similar to each other compared to back in the 1930s and the 1950s. Uh, there was more variety in, in body types of cars. It's because uh, when you have a, a mandate that says you must get so many miles to the gallon, that limits the, the size and the shape of the car because you have to worry about the aerodynamics. Uh, and so that that results in kind of a more boring car stock for Americans today versus Americans 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, by the way, we also owe the minivan to the uh, the fuel efficiency standards because minivans are effectively cars that can carry a lot of people, uh, and, and and so they uh, their fuel efficiency standards are based on truck fuel efficiency standards, or at least they they were originally. Um, so it was a way basically for companies to make cars that were not very fuel efficient, call them minivans and, uh, and you're good to go. So that regulation, that's a command and control regulation that has sort of shaped our lives in ways that we wouldn't have necessarily chosen to, uh, to, to shape them if it was left up to us as individuals. Uh, now the problem with... Uh, command and control that usually pops up is the regulator usually doesn't have all of the relevant knowledge. Okay, The regulator is trying to solve an externality problem, but from the perspective of the regulator, what usually makes sense is impose a regulation that is easy to enforce or easy to track or you know easy to control. So uh, it's pretty straightforward in the case of, of, say, automobiles to just say, they all must meet a certain fuel efficiency standard. You can watch that and track it and make sure that you are keeping your, uh, you're maintaining progress. Or in the case of uh, ele uh, um, electric electricity use, it's pretty pretty straightforward to uh, to just regulate all of the producers and tell them you have to produce up to this particular standard, right? Electric uh, use it electric power usage standard. And so the regulator is usually going to economize on his or her own costs. What's simple for me to implement? What is applicable across the board? Um, you know, what will make life easy for me? The problem is, what is easiest for the regulator to enforce is not always the most cost-efficient way of solving the problem. In fact, usually it's not going to be the most cost-effective uh, way of solving the problem because command and control is typically one size fits all, right? If you go back and think about uh, a Pigouvian tax, that's not a one size fits all solution in the sense that it doesn't force everybody to do the same thing. All you're telling the, the buyer and the seller with a Pigouvian tax is, you're welcome to trade as much as you want, and you can you can use this product you know however you want, produce it however you want. But every unit that you trade, you have to pay us money. And then once they've internalized that cost, you leave it to them to figure out what's the the cheapest, most efficient way 
uh, and highest value way to produce and consume the, uh, the, the good in question. But with command and control, you are typically telling everybody you have to all follow uh, the same road to uh, to reduce this this negative externality, and that's often the case. Often not going to be the most efficient way of doing it. For example, with um, electric power consumption, one thing that consumers can do to conserve on electric power is buy more few uh, energy efficient appliances. Okay, and some of them that might be the lowest cost method for them to reduce their, their consumption of electricity. But there are other things that people could do. For example, uh, some people, uh, if you just raise the price of electricity by imposing a tax on it, they might just become more conscientious about turning off the lights whenever they leave a room. Uh, there could be some people who decide that they'll just start washing dishes by hand instead of using their, um, their wash machine, which tends to be uh, kind of a, an electricity hog. Uh, or you might have some people who just turn up the thermostat. In summer, instead of using the air conditioning as much, and air conditioners are a huge electricity hog, uh, they just you know uh, keep the house a degree or two warmer than uh, they otherwise would have. And they could very easily uh, save just as much energy by doing that as by buying a fuel efficient, uh, not fuel efficient, an electric, uh, an electric efficient um uh, clothes washer and clothes dryer. Okay. Now, under those circumstances, every individual consumer is looking at the price of electricity with the tax imposed, and they're making the decision, they're adjusting their behavior in ways that are lowest cost to them. But when you impose the solution that says, no, you all just have to buy this particular kind of wash machine and clothes dryer, well, then you, uh, you know, some of them are would have had cheaper ways of using electricity, but they're forced to use this more uh, costly way. Now, uh, command and control can be appropriate under certain circumstances, as they discuss in your textbook and also in the MRU um, videos that, uh, that hopefully you've also watched. Particularly, command and control is going to be appropriate when the solution to the problem is well understood. With electric power usage, there is no way that the um, that the regulator has all the relevant knowledge to to know exactly who should be cutting their electric power use in in what way. But under certain circumstances, like in the textbook, they talk about uh, smallpox vaccines. Uh, the solution is pretty well understood. If you want to stop a smallpox outbreak, you need to find the people who who uh, the early cases of it. You need to isolate them from the surrounding community, and then you need to vaccinate everybody in the area because they might have been exposed to the measles, uh, measles virus. Um, and through this form of command and control, where the solution was well understood, uh, they were able to wipe out uh, measles starting in, I think they began trying to wipe out measles in the 1950s, and by 1973, the last case of measles in the wild uh, had uh, had taken place. The other time when command and control is necessary uh, is uh, is effective is when total compliance is necessary. Okay, when you really do need everybody on the same page, marching to uh, to the same beat, that's when command and control can make sense. Again, uh, com combating the measles epidemic is uh, or measles outbreaks is also a place where total compliance is necessary. You can't have one village or one person who just says, you know what, no thanks, I don't want a vaccine, uh, or no, I'm not going to, to allow you to uh, isolate me. If one person slips through the cracks, that one person could uh, carry the measles virus and then pass it on to others and, and it spreads. And so this might uh, have familiar, um, you know, kind of ring familiar to you with what we're going through right now with COVID-19. There's a lot of command and control going into place. And I do have friends who are literate in economics or friends who are economists who are skeptical of some of the, uh, call it the heavy handedness with which uh, state and local governments are uh, are dealing with the COVID-19 outbreak. However, there is a case to be made that we are in a situation where command and control is the appropriate uh, response to the negative externality of people passing COVID-19 onto each other. The solution is fairly well understood. We do know that if we're all 
washing our hands and staying clean and also maintaining uh, distance from each other to the extent possible. That will slow the spread and potentially stop the spread. Uh, and it is important that everybody comply with this because if half the population or a third of the population or even 5% of the population doesn't comply, those non-compliant individuals can pass the, uh, the disease on to those who, uh, who are trying to comply. So that's another uh, application of, of command and control. I want to talk about one last thing with command and control, how it can sometimes be used effectively uh, to, say, create property rights, where you can kind of uh, use a combination of command and control and markets uh, to get a reduction in a negative externality at the lowest cost possible. So let's walk through a very simple example. We're going to suppose that there are two different firms, firm A and firm B, and they are emitting some form of pollution. Maybe this pollution is carbon dioxide that's contributing to, um, uh, to global warming, or maybe it's nitrous oxide which contributes to, uh, to acid rain. Whatever it is, their emissions can be measured in tons. That's what the T refers to. And each of these firms is emitting 100,000 tons per year. Now, we would like to see them uh, reduce their emissions, but it's costly for them to do that. Uh, each of them would bear a cost for every ton that they reduce, but those costs are not the same. Firm A, it would cost them $50 per ton to reduce their emissions. And firm B, it would cost them $100 per ton to reduce their emissions. The reasons for these different costs uh, could spring from a number of different sources. It could be that these are two firms in different industries, so they emit the same pollutant, but they're producing different things. And so the factory of firm A has an easier time maybe substituting into some other uh, input to, uh, to reduce their, um, their emissions. Or it could be that they're in the same industry, but firm B has an older factory and it would be harder to retrofit that factory uh, in ways that would reduce the, uh, the emissions, whereas firm A has a, more, uh, a newer factory that um, it would be cheaper to, to retrofit it or to, to add on the new technologies to, uh, to reduce the, the, the emissions. Whatever the reason, it's cheaper for, for firm A uh, to reduce their emissions than it is for firm B. What does that mean? Well, let's also uh, add one thing to the side, which is the goal of the, uh, of the regulator is reduce the emissions by 10%. Now, what you would like to do if you're trying to reduce emissions at the lowest cost possible is make sure that it is firm A that does all of the emissions reduction. So there's 200,000 tons being emitted per year. 10% of 200,000 tons is 20,000 tons. If you had the right information as the regulator, you could go to firm A and say, all right, you, you have to cut your, uh, your emissions by uh, 20,000, right? You reduce by 20% and that will make it so that the industry in total has reduced the emissions by 10%. But you're going to run into some problems with that. One is a knowledge problem. If you go and ask these two firms how much is it going to cost you to reduce your emissions, they both have an incentive to lie to you because they want to convince you to get the other person to reduce their emissions. So that guy might say, well, it cost me $1,000 per ton. Uh, and you may end up uh, you know, uh, wrongly telling firm B that they're the firm that has to uh, reduce emissions by 20000 so that's one uh, one problem that you can run into it with. Another is there's also just kind of like a a fairness norm where this firm A could easily say, hey, why are you picking on me, right? Just because I'm the, the one who's lucky enough to have the, the lowest cost, you're going to put all the costs on me. A lot of people aren't going to find that fair. Firm A is going to fight tooth and nail against that. And plenty of legislators might also be uh, worried about, uh, you know, coming across as, as being unfair. So... A more common solution than telling this firm or that firm that they have to bear all the cost of reduction is you split it evenly across the two of them. So you're trying to reduce by 10%. That means you tell firm A, your reduction in emissions must be 10,000 tons uh, per year. And firm B, you must also reduce your emissions 
by 10,000 tons per year. All right, fair enough. Now, that meets sort of the fairness criterion. It also avoids the, the knowledge problem. But the issue is we can do better than that. We know that what would the best outcome would be Firm A voluntarily cuts their emissions by 20,000 uh, units, 20,000 tons, and Firm B doesn't cut by any. So we can see this in terms of the, uh, of the cost. So Firm A uh, is reducing 10,000 tons at a cost of $50 per ton. That's a $50,000 cost. Firm B is reducing 10,000 tons at a cost of $100 per ton. And the total cost of these two firms' reductions is 150000 okay? Now, if we could get firm A to cut their emissions by 20,000 tons, then those 20,000 tons times $50 per ton would only be $100,000 in cost, which is substantially less than $150,000. So this is the sort of trip typical command and control uh, solution. Down here we have another option, which is tradable permits. Instead of telling them you must reduce by this amount and you must reduce by that amount, what you could do instead is say, okay, look, we are going to create a right, a property right in emitting pollution. And we're going to give firm A 90,000 permits. Each permit allows them to emit one ton of this pollution into the atmosphere per year. 90,000 permits go to firm A, 90,000 fir permits go to firm B. So if you want firm A and firm B, you can just use those 90,000 permits and you're going to each have to reduce your, uh, your, your output of this pollution by 10,000 tons each. However, what we've given you is a property right, a right to, um, to pollute. And you can trade those permits with each other. You can trade those property rights. You can buy and sell them amongst yourselves. Now think about that. What's likely to happen in that situation? Well, firm A is going to think, okay, I could uh, use all 90 of these permits myself, and then it's going to cost me uh, $50 per ton on the 10,000 tons that I reduce. But if I could sell a permit for more than $50, then I make a profit on that transaction. Firm B could be thinking something similar. They could be thinking, well, uh, I could use all 90,000 of these my, on my own and cut my emissions by 10,000 uh, tons. But if I can buy a permit from firm A for less than $100, well, then I'll just pollute that extra ton and save money by, uh, by paying him to reduce his emissions instead of reducing mine. So they could agree on some price that presumably would be between $50 and $100 per ton, 150 and $100 per permit. Uh, and we would expect firm A to sell 10,000 of their permits off to firm B. And it would be firm A that would voluntarily reduce their, uh, their emissions by 20,000. And firm B would be paying them for some of that, uh, some of those emissions. So, how would that work out? Okay, the reduction we would be we're assuming here that firm B purchases ten thousand uh, permits from firm A. So firm A has to reduce by twenty thousand tons. They started with ninety thousand permits. They sold ten thousand of those to firm B, and so they have eighty thousand left. They they therefore will have to reduce their emissions by twenty thousand. However, they're lucky enough that they made a profit in, in, uh, in the market for these permits. So they have a, pre, a trade profit and loss. The, the, uh, the firm A is going to have a profit. Let's say that they, they agreed on a price of $75 uh, per permit. So they're exactly splitting the difference between their two costs. In that case, Firm A was able to sell 10,000 of their permits to Firm B for $75 per permit. So they turn a profit in the permit market of $75. However, they're going to have to reduce their, uh, their emissions. And the cost of reducing their emissions, well, they're reducing by 20,000 tons. It's costing them $50 per ton. And so they have 
costs of reducing their emissions of $100,000. On net, when you take their reduction costs and you uh, offset those against the profits they earned by trading, uh, selling off some of their permits, they will end up with a cost of $25,000. Notice that they are better off under this system than they were under command and control. Here, they only have a net cost of $25,000. Up here, it was a net cost of $50,000. What about Firm B? Well, Firm B bought those 10,000 uh, tradable permits from Firm A, so they don't have to reduce at all. That means that their, uh, their reduction cost will be zero. However, in order to avoid those reduction costs, they had to pay $75,000 to Firm A. And so in the trading, they're facing their profit and loss statement on trading is going to say they have a loss of or a cost of $75,000, the amount that they had to pay uh, to Firm A. Now, when you combine those two, the reduction cost and the trading cost, Firm B has a net cost of $75,000. Notice that they are also $25,000 better off with tradable permits than they were under the command and control system. So under command and control, the total cost of compliance is $150,000. When we allowed them to trade permits with each other, the total cost combined between the two of them is only $100,000. So it costs $50,000 less than command and control. And you can see that both of them are better off uh, as compared to the baseline of command and control. Now this is good for two different reasons. The first reason is if you can reduce pollution at a lower cost, that means that there's more resources left over to buy and produce other goods and services. So we can get just as much reduction in pollution and have money left over for more other things. The other reason why this is important is, as they point out in your, uh, your textbook, when the cost of reducing pollution is lower, we can get more of it, right? Uh, an economy can handle uh, more, you know, maybe, maybe the economy can handle uh, 30,000 tons in reduction or 25,000 tons in reduction if we know that we can get it at a cheaper cost of reduction uh, per ton, okay? So this, this system of tradable permits is this uh, combination of command. There is a command and control element because the government is saying you only have the right to, uh, to emit as much pollution as we give you permits for, but it, it, it uh, melds that command and control with a sort of property rights and, and market solution in the tradable permits. And it allows you to uh, get the same outcome cheaper than you would with just command and control on its own. All right, that is it for my lecture videos on chapter 10, externalities. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed them. And as always, be flexible, communicate, and stay awesome.